Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we have our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news about COVID-19 with AMA's Chief Health and Science Officer, Dr. Mira Irons in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Well, let's start with the big news, Dr. Irons. Another vaccine receives authorization this week. Can you tell us about the new J&J &J vaccine? Absolutely. It's been a big, uh, big weekend for vaccines in the United States. Um, the FDA authorized Johnson & Johnson Janssen's one-shot vaccine for emergency use on Saturday, making it a third vaccine available in the U.S. Um, this is a, a vaccine that's made on, a, on an adenovirus platform, um, and it is the first approved vaccine to require one dose instead of two. Um, shipments are expected to start within days. Um, Johnson Johnson has pledged to provide the United States with um, 100 million doses by the end of June. I heard this morning um, on an interview uh, with the, the, that the CEO did that they um, uh, have pledged 20 million doses by the end of the month. Um, when combined with the 600 million doses from the two-shot vaccines made by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna scheduled to arrive by the end of June, there'll be more than enough shots to cover any American adult who wants one, but it will take a few months to get there. The one thing that, that we have to remember, however, is that even though the new vaccine, this J&J &J vaccine, has a 72% efficacy in U.S. clinical trials, um, a number that scientists have celebrated, um, it's, it falls short of the roughly 95% rate found in studies testing the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. So, you know, across all trial sites, the J&J &J vaccine has shown 85% efficacy against severe forms of COVID-19 and 100% efficacy against hospitalization and death from the virus. And that's really what we have to focus on. Um, on Saturday, Dr. Fauci said, don't get caught up necessarily on the numbers game because it's a really good vaccine. And what we need is as many good vaccines as possible. Rather than parsing the difference between 94 and 72, accept the fact that now you have three highly effective vaccines, period. Um, so we have to keep reminding people that these vaccines have not been tested head to head. So it's impossible to do a really accurate comparison. What matters most, and it's what I, I I'd like people to focus on is they are all effective at preventing the most severe COVID outcomes, including hospitalization and death. And that's a pretty interesting thing. And I just want to dig slightly deeper on that. So 100 percent efficacy against hospitalization. Mm -hmm. So that is really significant. When you look at that kind of 72 versus 94, 95, are those just averages across any form of COVID, including asymptomatic all the way up through serious? How does that work? Well, the 72%, and they're all different, um, you know, in terms of the, the groupings, um, the 72% the is against moderate and severe disease. Um, and, you know, they, they were tested in, in different countries at different times. The 72% is the U.S. figure. Um, and so, you know, um, they, they're still... You know, no vaccine, and I think we've said this before, um, is 100% effective against uh, preventing, preventing disease. Um, these vaccines are tested against preventing uh, symptomatic disease. Um, and um, I think what Dr. Fauci is saying, that it's really important to focus on, on the, the severe end of the spectrum, you know, preventing okay. hospitalization and death. And is the guidance then still basically take whichever one that you can get first? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Whatever's available, the guidance is, you know, these are all rigorously tested, um, good vaccines and um, take whichever one you can get as early as you can. I know going into this situation, uh, the kind of minimum threshold was, I believe, somewhere around 50 percent. So we're well in excess of that. And uh, that's really good news. Well, let's talk a little bit more about vaccine distribution. Last uh, couple of weeks have uh, got a little bit of a blow from all those snowstorms. Are we starting to catch up uh, uh, from these weather delays? Yeah, absolutely. We are coming back. Um, providers are administering the latest um, figures are about 1.65 million doses per day on average. On Saturday, the CDC said that about 48.4 million people have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine and about 23.7 million have been fully vaccinated. So that's more than 72 million um, uh, 
people in total. Um, and as supply has increased, states have expanded eligibility. Um, some teachers are now able to get shots in 32 states. You know, as we as we talked over the last few weeks, every state is looking at eligibility differently. Um, so it's really important for physicians to understand um, how the states are expanding eligibility in order to help their patients um, uh, with the latest information. That's good news. Well, let's talk a little bit about this week's numbers. We are seeing something uh, you know, that I found alarming over the weekend, which is kind of a plateauing in the decrease that we've been seeing over last, uh, the last few weeks. What, what's behind that? Yeah, well, so, you know, the numbers as of today, 28,606,224 cases and 513,092 deaths. Um, and you're right, you know, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about a steep decline in numbers, but that seems to have plateaued a bit. Um, and there are signs that reports of new infections are starting to level off. Federal health officials have warned governors against relaxing pandemic restrictions in light of this need. They feel that it's too early, especially as vaccines are starting to roll out. If you just look at Saturday's figures, um, 62,694 new cases were reported in the U.S. on Saturday um, and at least uh, 1,567 new deaths. So if you, if you look at averages, you know, over the past week, there's been an average of 68,478 cases per day a decrease of 28% from the average two weeks earlier, but still kind of stuck at, at 68,000. Um, you know, case numbers remain as low as they have been since October. But, you know, the one thing that I think we should remember also is that, um, you know, the first two surges, the one, the point that Dr. Fauci makes a lot is that we never came down to baseline um, before we started, you know, governors and, and local officials started um, relaxing restrictions. Um, and, you know, I, we, I worry about that happening again. You know, we were coming down really quickly, but um, we're, we're nowhere near baseline um, at this point. Yeah, even, uh, you know, here in Chicago, we're still at, you know, quote, a very, very high level, uh, despite the, that decrease. And we had our first beautiful day here on Saturday. And I will tell you, hashtag guard down, uh, especially I'm seeing a lot of young people who are just uh, uh, not doing, you know, taking the kind of precautions and we need to kind of hang in there. Yeah. Uh, while this plays out. So uh, let's move on to kind of what uh, we're seeing as key drivers this week. Um, mm -hmm. What's what are, what are, what's driving the trends? Sure. So, um, you know, we haven't talked about this in a while, but we're st still seeing colleges as drivers. Um, about 120,000 cases have been linked to colleges in 2021 um, and more than 530,000 since the start of the pandemic. More than 6,600 cases have emerged in college athletic departments. So it's important to keep keep focusing on colleges also. Um, you know, the other is Texas. Um, Texas is a possible super spreader event. You know, obviously, um, you know, um, more than a week after the winter storms hit, some experts say that the conditions which forced hundreds of people across the state to huddle together in homes, car, cars, and shelters could lead to an increase in coronavirus cases. Also, you know, there were data reporting um, issues during the storm, and so we're, we're, it's hard to tell what the impact of the events in Texas might have. Um, however, there is cause for, for concern. If you look at the CDC data tracker website today, it looks as though, you know, the numbers in Texas seem to be coming up a little from, from the drop that they had, so it'll be important to watch. Also important to watch um, new variants in California and New York are being um, reported, um, and people are studying it you know, to see um, its effect on whether it can, um, uh, how it affects the immune system. Um, and the last thing is always behavior. You know, um, we're, we're not quite sure why we've come, all of, the, all of the reasons for coming down from this last surge. Obviously, human behavior is something that you'd like to contribute to decrease in cases. Um, but, um, you know, we still, it still requires people to, to be really um, careful um, with the mitigation measures. All right. Well, uh, one additional issue that has kind of arisen over the past week is around counterfeit respirators. And there was some new guidance from the CDC uh, that came out last week. Can you talk about what the issue is and, and what we're hearing from the CDC? 
Oh, absolutely. And I would, um, this is really important, and I would ask all physicians uh, to take a minute and go to the CDC website. Um, they issued a public notice about counterfeit respirators updated on Friday. These are N95s. Um, it's important for physicians to be aware of and also pass on to their patients. They found that some respirators are falsely marketed and sold as being NIOSH approved. NIOSH is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and they may not be capable of providing appropriate respirators respiratory protection. Um, as NIOSH becomes aware of the counterfeit respirators or those misrepresenting NIOSH approval, they're posting them on the CDC website to alert users, purchasers, and manufacturers. Um, the CDC also lists signs to look for that indicate a respirator might be counterfeit, such as NIOSH spelled incorrectly, um, the presence of decorative fabric or other decorative add-ons such as sequins, claims that they're approved for children, NIOSH doesn't approve any type of respiratory protection for children and ear loops instead of headbands. So th those are really important things that physicians should be aware of. Well, the sequins are always a dead giveaway. Uh, so uh, that is interesting that that would even be uh, a possible problem there. So uh, lastly, uh, any key messages from the AMA this week? Yep, so last Thursday um, was the launch of the um, It's Up To You campaign. Um, the AMA has partnered with the Ad Council and the COVID Collaborative on that effort. Um, the campaign is, is aimed at educating millions of Americans about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, it represents one of the largest public education efforts in U.S. history. More than 300 major brands, media companies, community-based organizations, faith leaders, medical experts, and other trusted messengers are supporting the campaign campaigns designed to reach distinct audiences. Um, it's created in close partnership with the CDC, ensuring that all messaging is rigorously vetted and backed by science. Um, and the campaigns urge audiences to visit getvaccineanswers.org to get the latest information about COVID-19 vaccines, with the ultimate goal of helping the public feel confident and prepared to get vaccinated once the vaccine is available to them. Yes, well, it really is up to you. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Irons, for your update and continuing perspective. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment shortly. In the meantime, for information on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.